Bible here, we're looking at Assyria, now the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire, which was a thorn in Israel's side during her kingdom period, traces its history back to the days of Nimrod and another ruler in that day named Asher. It says in Genesis 10, 8 and 9, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, Even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh and the city Rehoboth and Kala. So, all the way back to the time of Nimrod, Nimrod right after the flood, the name Assyria is from Asher, who became a god in Assyrian mythology. This is in agreement with the Bible's statement that Asher founded Nineveh. Asher's symbol was a warrior with a bow in his hand and wearing a fringed robe, which reminds us of the Bible's description of Nimrod as a mighty hunter. The Assyrian kings used Asher as an example of military prowess. This is a carving of Asher Nasser Paul fighting from his chariot with the symbol of Asher with a drawn bow above him. So the king there fighting. The winged disc symbolizes Asher as the sun god. We've looked at all that symbology earlier. This image was sometimes reduced to the winged disc and circling across. Uh, plus the bottom of Asher's robe with the bow at the top. And sometimes merely to the disc and the robe, the fringes of which became the rays of the sun. In the latter days of the kingdom of northern Israel, Assyria was a powerful empire that controlled much of the Middle East. It was Assyria that destroyed Samaria in 721 BC. The green denotes the Assyrian Empire. That's a pretty big uh, chunk of, of land that they had controlled at that time. Assyrian annals mention nine Hebrew kings, Omri, Ahab, Jehu, Manaam, Pekah, Uzziah, Ahaz, Hezekiah, and Manasseh. So this is extra biblical, you know, uh, carvings that they found that mention those nine Hebrew kings. There are at least 55 rulers, cities, and countries that appear both in the Bible and in the ancient Assyrian records. The Assyrian Empire was prosperous, technologically advanced, and very wicked. And they were wicked. Boy, they were some cruel people. The Bible describes its chief moral characteristics as pride, violence, deceit, covetousness, idolatry, and witchcraft. It sounds a lot like today. This description has been confirmed by archaeology. Assyria's kings mentioned in the Bible. Six Assyrian kings are mentioned by name in the Bible. These kings ruled at the height of the Assyrian Empire from 745 to 627 BC, from the time of King Hezekiah to that of King Josiah. At that time, Nineveh was destroyed by Babylon. Tiglath Pileser, also called Pul, he put Israel under tribute during the reign of Menahem. Um, we can read about that. And you can read about his, he's mentioned there, 2 Kings 15, 19 to 20. He carried some of the northern cities into captivity. He also took tribute from Ahaz in 2 Kings 16. You can read about that. Shalmaneser V, he besieged Samaria and died during the siege. He's mentioned in 2 Kings 17.3 and 18.9. Sargon II, he completed the destruction of Samaria and the captivity of Israel in 721 B.C. and is mentioned in Isaiah. So this is like, so when we talk about the times of the kings, you've got the United Kingdom and it stayed united under who knows how many kings. Anybody know how many kings it stayed united under? No? All right. It was the first three. It was united under the first three. So Saul, David. Who's after David? Solomon. Okay, and then Solomon's son. Oh, I forget his name. Um, can't remember his name, but he's the one that split it. So it was partially united under him, and then just poor leadership. The north rebelled against the south. So the south is known as, um, why can't I think? Like basically Jerusalem and uh, Benjamin, and then you have the 10 northern tribes. Okay, so what this is talking about here is the destruction of Samaria, the captivity of Israel. That's the northern kingdoms. Okay, the northern 10 kingdoms basically is what this is dealing with. Okay, Sennacherib, his army was defeated at the gates of Jerusalem by the angel of the Lord. That's a, a great story right there. Get a chance to read it, 2 Kings 18. And Isaiah 36 to 37, he was murdered by his sons as he worshipped his idol, Nisroch. Sounds like a good family to be a part of. Esar Haddon, he took the throne after Sennacherib was murdered. He is also mentioned in Ezra 4 too. 
Asher Banapal, he destroyed Thebes in Egypt and collected a great library. He's mentioned in Ezra 4.10. Assyria's palaces. Sennacherib's palace in Nineveh had 71 rooms and was called the palace without a rival. I mean, that's pretty impressive right there, just looking at that depiction of it. And we'll see uh, the architecture of it here in just a bit. A drawing of Sennacherib's palace from the Oriental Institute. That's, that's pretty big when you look at it. Uh, look at the size of the people. A series of palaces. The rooms were lined with stone slabs covered with bas reliefs depicting hunting and military exploits. Um, so these are some of them, some of the depictions that were on the walls of that palace. I mean, that's pretty incredible the way they have done all this, the detail that goes into that. Nineveh's walls were 30 feet high, 45 feet thick, and had 15 great gates. The inner city wall was seven miles in circuit and was fronted by a deep moat. Water was brought into the city by canals and aqueducts from as far as 25 miles away. Now, that's some work right there, man, to bring that much water 25 miles away. Uh, these were the gates at Shah Manasseh's palace, pretty big. They were made of wood reinforced by strips of bronze embossed with military scenes. Just the detailed work that goes into this. I like this here. The throne rooms of the palaces were guarded by Lamassu, which were human-headed winged bulls or lions. These are idolatrous creatures. The head signifies intelligence, the wings speed, the body power. They had five legs so that when viewed from the front, they appeared to be standing still. But when viewed from the side, they appeared to be walking. So there it is again from the front. They're standing there from the side, moving. A serious grand library. Archaeologists unearthed a 30,000 volume library belonging to Asher Banapal. Now, now look at this 30,000 volume library, but look at their books. Okay, could you imagine the space they needed for all that and how they're going to store that and make it easily accessible? Um, so those are on display at the British Museum there. The surviving books are written on clay tablets, but the original library would have been vastly larger. Um, the books written on leather scrolls, wax boards, and papyri have perished. The library is spread out into many rooms according to subject matters such as history, religion, geography, science, and poetry. That's just like a library today. I mean, they're, you know. Each room contained a tablet near the door classifying the contents, and each section had a brief description, so you'd know what was in that section. The actual cataloging activities under Asher Banapal's direction would not be seen in Europe for centuries. For centuries. The Assyrians, this is the crazy part here as we get into some of this. The Assyrians were exceedingly cruel. It's no wonder God's word called Nineveh the bloody city in Nahum 3.1. Um, I believe this is a, a picture of the battle of Lachish, which is in Israel. Um, and we'll get more details about that. Assyria's cruelty. Consider the following description of Asser, Nasser Paul's military campaign into Syria from a bas relief at his palace at Kala. So this is their depiction of the battle, okay, the, the Assyrians' depiction of the battle. Uh, Asser Nasser Paul said this, I built a pillar over against his city gate, and I flayed all the chief men. Do you know what flaying is? Skinned them. They skinned them. Okay, that's pretty nasty right there. I flayed all the chief men. I covered the pillar with their skins. Some I walled up within the pillar. Some I impaled upon the pillar on stakes. Okay, by the way, we'll look at this later, but the picture right there is them skinning those guys. Okay. I cut off the limbs of the officers. Many captives from among them I burned with fire, and many I took as living captives. From some I cut off their hands, and from others I cut off their noses, their ears, and their fingers. So this was a, a cruel foe to go against. Probably, I'm sure for some of it, I'm sure some of them they did. I, we don't know for certain, but I'm sure they did. Um, but this was like not an enemy whose hands you want to fall into. You're like, I want to die before. If, if we lose, I want to die. All right. And they were a powerful force to be reckoned with. He goes on to say, of many, I put out the eyes. I made one pillar of the heads and I bound their heads to posts round about the city. A pillar of heads. and bound their heads to posts round about the city as a warning. You can see in the picture right there, they're holding a head and the body laying below them. So 
Assyrian soldiers. That, that was the picture we showed earlier. It was smaller. Now you can see it. Flame captives at Lachish. So that's Israelites. That's on Jews. Okay, that's what's happening right there. The triangular shapes depict the helmets of the Assyrian soldiers signifying the vastness of the army. Uh, prisoners being impaled. So you can see their bodies hanging from the, the posts there. Cutting off of a captive's head. There they are in the act. Counting heads of defeated enemies, just thrown there on the floor. No wonder Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh to preach. All right. That's important to keep in mind. Okay. The Jews had a hatred for the Assyrians. Probably everyone around them had a hatred for them because they were so cruel. And Nineveh said, I'm not going to those people. He was biased towards them and did not want to help them. He didn't want to show mercy when God did. All right, so that's why he went the other way, and then he wasn't even happy about it afterwards. He's like, I know you're merciful, and I know you're going to save these people. And that's what God did, and he was kind of bitter about the mission God sent him on. I mean, we know he was faithful in the end, but read the rest of the story. Go to chapter 4, finish reading it. Um, but this is why he didn't want to go to Nineveh to preach, because this is the type of people they were. Now, Assyrian kings and hunting. The Assyrian kings prided themselves in their great hunting expertise, and many of the panels lining the palace walls depicted their exploits. In this, they were following in the footsteps of Nimrod, the founder of the Babylonian Assyrian empires, who was a mighty hunter, as the Bible says. The Bible says that lions were once plentiful in Israel and the Mesopotamian region. Apparently, they've been hunted out mostly. They hunted lions from horseback. They hunted from chariots. All right. That takes some bravery. I'm just saying right now to hunt a lion. All right. Even now with a rifle. I wouldn't want to hunt a lion from horseback if it's charging at me, like the picture depicts. Now, if it's like 100 yards off, I'm like, cool, I can shoot it. But back then, you're going to have to get pretty close to kill it. I mean, even with a bow and arrow, you're going to have to be pretty close to it. And one's probably not going to take it down. Look at some of the pictures. That one's got three, four in it. Um, we'll see some other pictures of it. That does take some bravery. Wouldn't want to have to do that. So they hunted them from chariots. They hunted with dogs. Those are some fierce looking dogs. Even with their bare hands, if the carvings are to be believed. I'm, I'm sure if you're regularly hunting them, one's going to get at you. And you're going to have to fight it off with your hands. And hopefully you got a friend close by with a, a, a steak or something to kill that thing. So they were captured for the royal hunts and then released. They were herded by the soldiers. So that one there, one, two, you know, three, four, four arrows in it. Look at the, the detail of this. You can see this one arrow right here going into the body, and then they picture it coming out over here. I mean, that's some detail they put into this. That one looks dead. It took four arrows, three arrows on that one. All right, Assyria's military. The facts about Assyria's military provide a fascinating background to the accounts of the Old Testament. Cavalry. Cavalry was an important part of the Assyrian armies, and they are frequently mentioned in the Bible. The horses appear to be of a noble breed, and the Arabian horse is still celebrated today. It has a small head, large nostrils, short body, and slender legs. Arabians are some beautiful horses. If you know what an, an Arabian horse is, look up. They have a, a smaller, like the snout's smaller. Their head's smaller. There's some beautiful horses, a lot of show horses. They used to have here every two years. I don't know if they still do, but an Arabian horse show. Beautiful horses. Just some pictures in those, the decorations they had in the palace of the horses. Habakkuk said these Chaldeans horses are swifter than the leopards and more fierce than the evening wolves. So they're brave. Chariots. The chariot is mentioned 177 times in the Bible, and the Assyrians used it to great advantage. Normally, when it wants to show how powerful an army is, the Bible mentions how many chariots they had, and that would instill fear in the other armies going to, to fight them. Uh, the number of chariots. It's like if it, today, I, I liken it to like if you're going to battle and there's a bunch of tanks coming, and you're just all on foot. Okay, that's like, oh, great. We got 
How many tanks are coming? You didn't want to do that. Siege tactics. The Assyrians used battering rams and stone-throwing instruments. The siege engine battered the walls by means of a lever worked from inside the machine. So this is why they had those great gates reinforced the steel so that they couldn't just break in easily and you can hopefully from inside your you know your city walls you can keep them at bay and not let them break in and then kill all of you so here's a picture in one of the reliefs of them at work you can see the bricks falling down they're trying to get in um, archers protected by shield bearers fought from the top of the machine in the siege of Lachish in Israel, this kind of engine was used to attack the top of the walls. Here you see the engine on a siege ramp made of stone and earth. So they build the ramp up, and it's going up and attacking the top of the city wall. The archers stood off and shot at the defenders from behind shields. Some attacked from ladders while others dug tunnels in the walls. So you can see at the bottom... Here they're trying to dig a hole through and climbing through, breaking breaking it up over there. And you can see them climbing up this ladder, this guy right here. Look at the top right there under the W where it says ladders while. See that guy is holding a rock. So at the same time they're climbing up, they're trying to, you know, throw rocks at them, do anything they can to keep them off. I mean, they, I don't know if in this, but I know back in the day they'd dump hot oil on them. I mean, they would do stuff like that. I don't know, too to keep the enemy at bay. Personal military equipment. The Assyrians used a variety of hand weapons, bows and arrows, some pictures there, spears, swords, daggers, observe the helmets and upper body armor, probably chainmail. These are actual arrows from the siege of Lachish at the British Museum. So that was a battle against the Israelites. And those are the actual arrowheads from that. Bone arrowheads from the siege. An iron lance head from the siege on display at the British Museum. Skilled slingers were often used in combination with archers. During sieges, their role was to pick off the enemy from the city ramparts. Slingers could hurl a projectile at over 100 miles an hour with an effective range in excess of 100 yards. That's pretty good. Think about that, 100 yards. So that right there is like the type of slingshot that David had. Okay, that's what it was talking about right there. Everyone could sling stones at an hairbreadth and not miss, it says in Judges 2016. The stones were at least half the size of a man's fist. It's a pretty good size come hurling at you. These are some of the actual stones from the siege on display at the British Museum. A depiction of what a sling would look like, slingshot. It just basically like start swinging it around your head and then you let go of one side and just just launch that thing. So that's going to take some practice. If you've ever tried something like that, it's not, you don't like do it in the wide open. Don't do it around houses because you don't know where that thing's going to go. Just a suggestion. All right. They had two types of shields. One was small for close in combat. The other was large enough to hide behind for siege and long distance combat. Now, the Gilgamesh Flood Epic. In the Assyrian Library at Nineveh, archaeologists found a copy of the Gilgamesh Flood Epic. There are fragments in the British Museum, the Oriental Museum, and elsewhere. It purports to be the account that Utnapishtim told Gilgamesh of how he survived the flood and gained immortality. Gilgamesh was the king of Erech in about 2500 BC, which is near the time of the flood, and it's possible that the Gilgamesh mythology is based on Nimrod. Genesis 10.10 10 says Eric was the beginning of Nimrod's kingdom. Okay, so Gilgamesh was the king of Eric in about 2500 BC. Skeptics have used the Gilgamesh epic as evidence that the Bible's flood account is just one among many ancient legends. <coughs> Let's see, 2,000 years ago, Peter prophesied of scoffers in the end times who will deny the global flood. Let's go ahead and look at that. Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Second Peter 3 3. 
It says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. <clears throat> For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved under fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So here's the questioning. Where's the promise of his coming? He's been saying that since the beginning. Um, you know, it's it's the, the scoffers being mentioned. They're going to deny his coming. They're going to deny the flood. <coughs> but you got to ask yourself, where did this flood account come from close to the time <coughs> of the actual flood? Do you remember when we looked at <coughs> Nimrod? Sorry, my throat. When we looked at Nimrod, <clears throat> Noah was still alive during the time of Nimrod. Okay, so why would there be another account that, you know, exaggerates likely what happened? But <clears throat> to me, it's not like, oh, there's big C. It's just, it's just another of many. The biblical account is just another of many flood, flood myths. No, these ones are all perversions of what actually happened. But to me, it's further evidence that there was a global flood. And these are the people afterwards that heard the story from Noah's lips. And then it, it just, they, as they departed from God, they turned it into their own thing for their own benefit or whatever the reason was. Now, the Gilgamesh epic is dramatically different from the biblical account. Gilgamesh is an account of pagan gods who are weak and manlike and competitive. They are dishonest and deceptive. When the god Ea tells letting a pitch to him about the flood, he instructs him to keep it a secret by deceiving other men. He is to give them the impression that the gods are going to send blessing. When the storm comes, the gods are so frightened that they flee to heaven and cower like dogs. The Gilgamesh Ark is a cube 200 feet square and six stories tall, which would have been ridiculously unstable and the roll factor would have been murderous. By contrast, Noah's Ark described in the Bible was perfectly proportioned for sea travel. It's roughly the same dimension of like aircraft carriers today, cruise, cruise ships. <clears throat> the Gilgamesh flood lasts only six days and nights. As an adopted son of Pharaoh, educated in all the learning of Egypt and Babylon, Moses would have been familiar with these fables, yet there's not a hint of such things in his writings. And why do they mention Moses? Because Moses is the one that wrote about the flood. Shamanasser's Black Obelisk. <laughs> This monument depicts five foreign kings bringing tribute to the Assyrian monarch. Second series of panels from the top shows King Jehu of northern Israel bowing before Shalmaneser. Um, sad day for Israel. The obelisk resides in the British Museum. The symbols for Assyrian sun god and for Ishtar appear on top of the panels. You can see them up there. <clears throat> and there's the king of Israel bowing. The king of Assyria stands before Jehu, and an attendant is holding an umbrella to shade the king. An attendant armed with a sword is beckoning for Jehu's servants to bring the tributes forward. This is no different than today when, you know, kings or presidents of countries meet and they're taking pictures. This is exactly what they're doing. Same thing, they just didn't have cameras. <clears throat> so he's having them bring forth the loot, basically the tribute. And there they are holding whatever it is that they're bringing. Jehu and his servants have beards and are wearing long robes with decorated peaked caps and pointed shoes. The inscription says, The tribute of Jehu, son of Omri, I received from him silver, gold, a golden bowl, a golden vase with pointed bottom, golden tumblers, golden buckets, tin, a staff for a king, and spears. And there they are bringing everything. Other panels on the obelisk depict two humped camels and elephants brought by other kings from the region of India. The Bible does not mention Jehu's tribute to Shalmaneser, but it does say that he disobeyed God and was given over to his enemies. Shalmaneser's steel. This monument at the British Museum describes the first six military campaigns of Shalmaneser, 
King Ahab of Israel and King Ben-Hadad of Syria are mentioned in the battle of Karkara or Karkara, however you want to spell it. He says, I approached Karkara, I destroyed, tore down, and bound Karkara, his royal residence. <clears throat> he brought along to help him 1,200 chariots, 200 cavalrymen, 20,000 foot soldiers belonging to Ben-Hadad of Damascus, 2,000 chariots, 10,000 foot soldiers belonging to Ahab the Israelite. So they came ready to fight. The annals of Til Tiglath Pileser. Tiglath Pileser also pool mentioned four of Israel's kings in his records. Here he is in his chariot. <clears throat> Picture of him, and they're holding an umbrella for him. As for Nahum, I overwhelmed him like a snowstorm, and he fled like a bird alone, and I and bowed to my feet. I returned him to his place and imposed tribute upon him. So I conquered him, embarrassed him, shamed him in front of his people, and now we returned him and imposed tribute. Now you're going to give us money every year is what's going to happen for us to let you live. For us to let you live as the king, you know, you're like a, a puppet regime is basically what it is. You're going to do what we tell you to. You're going to represent our government, but we'll let you live in your palace and, and live better than everybody else. But basically, here's what you're going to do. You're going to pay us every year. <clears throat> the Bible says, And Pool, the king of Assyria, came against the land, and Manaim gave Pool a thousand talents of silver that his hand might be with him to confirm the kingdom in his hand. See, he's getting to keep his kingdom. Annals of Tiglath-Pilser. Also confirm the events of 2 Kings 15 and 16, the captivity of the Galilee region, the assassination of Pekah, the enthronement of Hosea, Ahaz's tribute, and the resin of Syria's slain. So it talks about all of it, and it confirms it. Just what the Bible says, secular history, archaeology ends up confirming what the Bible says. <clears throat> the Astartu Relief. The Astartu Relief at the British Museum depicts the capture of the city of Astartu in northern Israel. This occurred when the Assyrian armies attacked northern Israel and Galilee a few years before the final destruction of Samaria. The bottom shows the King Tiglath Pileser driven in his chariot led by two honor guards. The top shows Jewish captives led away by an armed guard. They are clothed in fringe robes and skull caps and pointed shoes. That must have been popular at the time. <clears throat> Sargon and Sennacherib. For Sargon and the fall of Samaria and Sennacherib's siege of Lachish, Jerusalem, and his death at the hands of his sons, see Archaeology 6, Hezekiah and his time. So we're going to look at all that later. Um, the destruction of Assyria. God used Assyria as an instrument to punish Israel, but her day of judgment came and it was terrible to behold. Israel still lives, but Assyria is only a museum piece. Now, that's interesting to note that God used Assyria as an instrument to punish Israel. Okay, when God's judgment falls on a nation, okay, this is throughout the Bible, you can see this. But when God's judgment falls on a nation, more often than not, He uses another nation to judge that nation. Okay? That's what he does. It's usually through war, and horrible things that happen during war is typically God's judgment on a nation. Okay? When a nation just gives themselves over to idolatry, witchcraft, and wickedness, and just rebellion, God says, okay, that's enough, and here's the punishment. And another army will come in. They, they, they don't have to be a godly people. God says, I'm going to use them as my instrument to punish you for your rebellion towards me. And that's what God does. And you can see it. Just read the Bible. Keep that in mind. And you'll see it over and over again. Oftentimes. So let's look at the promised land, for example. What was the, the promised land? It was Canaan, right? All right. And, and God used Israel to judge the nations that were in the promised land. Okay. He gave them quite a long time to get things right. But they did not desire to follow God. So he then used the children of Israel, the Jews coming out of Egypt as his judgment on those wicked nations. Okay, and it was pretty severe because his instruction to those na to, to the Israelites about those nations was kill everyone, don't leave anybody alive. Everyone. That was God's instructions. Why? Because these people were so wicked, God said, that's enough. Let's just move them. Get rid of them. His warning was, if you don't obey me in this, they are going to be a thorn in your flesh, a thorn in your side. 
okay? If you've ever had something like that, you know, <clears throat> maybe in your shirt you have a splinter or something stuck in your shirt or a sticker somewhere in your shirt and you can't find it and you've looked for it and you're like, I think I got it. And then you go and you move a certain way and there it is. It's stabbing you in the side. And, and it's just a, a constant pain, a constant annoyance. Okay, that's the picture that he's giving. And that's exactly what happened. Read through Israel's history. You want a, a quick study of that? Read through the book of Judges. Okay, the book of Judges is constantly the people around them are a, a, a menace to them. And they continually pulled them away from God. And they would harm them and hurt them and take things from them. And it's all because of their disobedience. They didn't obey God and exactly what <clears throat> God warned them of happened. They were a thorn in their flesh. And that was basically all of Israel's problems with idolatry came about because they disobeyed God in separating from these people. All right. So this is how he used Assyria as a judgment on the people of Israel. The destruction of Assyria was prophesied in Isaiah 10 and Ezekiel 31. And the destruction of Nineveh in particular was prophesied in Nahum 2 and 3 and Zephaniah 2, 13 through 15. Nahum prophesied about 713 BC, which was a century before Nineveh fell. Consider the precision of the prophecies. Okay, the city wouldn't endure a long siege. You know what? We're going to stop right here. <clears throat> okay. I don't, I don't want to get into all this so we can look at it and we'll open the Bible and look what the Bible says and then we'll see exactly what happens. So we'll pick up with this next week. All right.